Our speed debates, rules are very simple. We've got two teams. Each team is gonna have four people. Uh, I get to decide who's affirmative and who's negative, which means some people are gonna be talking about things that they don't necessarily wanna talk about, and that's okay. The affirmative is gonna to get to speak first, then our negative, our affirmative gets to rebut, our negative gets to rebut, and then you all get to vote on who wins. And at the end of the speed debates, we tally it all up, and we decide who wins, okay? Simple? Thumbs up, everybody good? Yes, awesome. So with that, let's do some introductions. When I call your name, come on up. You can say a little sentence or so about yourself. And then, uh, yeah, pick a seat. So the first person I'm gonna call to the stage, since he's sitting right here, see if our mic works, is Dan Kukendall. Give it up. Hello. I, uh, for those that don't know, I was the uh, founder and CTO of NT Objectives. Now I'm part of Rapid7, uh, where we're hooking everything up together with Metasploit and Expos and having fun. Sweet. All right. Next person up here is Ben Hughes. Come on up. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm a hair care specialist who works at Etsy. All right, thank you. Next up on our panel is Bankam Tejani. Give it up. Bankam Tejani, I'm a senior manager for application security at Under Armour. Sweet. Next up is the one, the only, Jack Daniel. I'm, I'm Jack. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you keep that one. All right. Uh, next up is Boyd Hemphill. Hi, I'm Boyd Hemphill. I'm a technology evangelist at Stack Engine, and I've been sober for, well, most of my life. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm sorry, but I'm going to lower the average IQ on this side. No, no worries. Random selection. All right. Your master of ceremonies for the day, the chair of LastCon this year, Mr. James Wicked. Hey, howdy. All right, next up, Dan Cornell. Uh, Dan Cornell, I'm the, uh, one of the founders of the CTO of Denner Group, and I think I'm the only panelist who brought my own koozie. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, last but not least, I'm not seeing it, there he is, Chris Poland. Howdy all, I work for a mega vendor who I won't name. This is my first time at LastCon and I'm a last minute substitute, so I'll try to do my best. <laughs> Keep the mic, you'll need it. Keep the mic. All right, so now that we've got the introductions out of the way, it's time to get to our first debate. Position number one, developers will still need to be concerned about cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in five years. Our affirmative team over here, our negative team over here, Where's my timekeeper? Right here. My timekeeper, Mr. David Hughes, I suggest that they hold a glass of water and sit in front of whoever's speaking at the moment, and when time's up, splash them in the face, but it got uh, vetoed. So unfortunately, David's just gonna make a loud noise when time is up. Just use fine. beer instead. So two minutes on the clock. Affirmative, who's gonna speak first? We ready? All right, two minutes, and then you can pass the mic however you want. Cross-site scripting. You know, it's one of those things. We've, we've had it in our life a pretty long time. I mean, you, you look back five years ago, what was on OWASP top 10? Anybody? Cross-site scripting. Let's go back 10 years. What do we got? It's, yeah. Three, yeah, three, one, okay. Back to three. Uh, just guessing, I mean, 
Jack, Jack did sort of prepare us earlier and said that like problems that we had in the 60s, like we're still having today, I'm guessing, you know, another five years isn't going to stop cross-site scripting. Let, let's look at all those older problems we had that we fixed, such as uh, sharing credentials, no. Um, buffer overflows, no. Um, like everything else in security that we haven't solved, I'm pretty confident cross-site scripting will be the one we get right because we don't have multiple websites. They're not getting more complicated. OAuth has stopped existing. Um, um, web frameworks are getting more opinionated but not necessarily better. Um, they're just getting more names, at least I'm finding in the Bay Area, and jQuery is newer, and Angular, et cetera. So I'm confident that'll be fixed. That'll be the one we fixed with, uh, yeah, definitely that one. It's really, it's obvious that developers are still going to need to be worried about cross-site scripting in five years because uh, if we fixed any problems, then we couldn't have cool conferences like this. So it's, it's really unthinkable. <laughs> Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's, it, and how much time we got left here? It's, it's not, not going to get, get fixed. fixed. Uh, uh, ten, ten seconds. seconds? Ten seconds. No, no we'll we'll, we'll still, still be fighting, fighting this in five years. Boom! Drop the mic. All right. Negative. Two minutes on the clock. Who's starting? No. It actually. Uh, I think it's safe to say that developers won't need to be concerned about cross-site scripting in five years, because we will find even dumber shit for them to ignore. I don't think we're going to have to worry about it because of the robot uprising. There's not going to be any humans to uh, do stupid shit. I think it's not going to be a concern anymore because uh, James at Signal Sciences is going to in invent some great technology to, to prevent any exploits, wow. and, and Dan is going to use ThreadFix to make sure we can all track it and get rid of them early in the, in the SDLC. Let's explore the word care for a minute. Do developers really care about cross-site scripting, or do they just deal with it? Actually. I don't think they will care in five years because most of those things will be built into a CI pipeline, so they won't have to care. And what we'll be doing is worrying about that one engineer who wants to break things, and they'll be the one that cares. Will they be a developer? Probably not. They'll probably be a security engineer. I did say that out loud. All right. Good. Drop the mic. Audience? Well, do we need a rebuttal? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> would, would you like? I mean, I, he I, don't, I don't really know if we need a rebuttal. James, he dropped the mic. The, the game is over. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Bankham, you have quite impeccable logic. Um, can't really argue with that part. Um, so, you know, but, but I, I will persist to say that we'll continue to have the problem. Yeah, I think the robot uprising will be halted by a cross-site scripting attack. <laughs> We'll be thanking cross-site scripting for existing when those robots come to eat our heads. <laughs> this is just the first question, guys. Cross-site scripting is the four-year lifespan of the simulants of the robot uprising. Our Blade Runner future will be saved by cross-site scripting. You'll be thanking us, not just for conferences, but for the robots not killing every one of us. All right, time's up. Negative, you get one more shot. I believe that the team on the other side of the stage has completely missed the point. The question was, will they care, not will there be cross-site scripting? Because their arguments are weak, we'll they try to change the question. The question is, will developers care? The answer is, no. <laughs> Why would they start five years from now? <laughs> because of the robot uprising. <laughs> Case rested. All right. Case closed. Audience, you get to vote. If you think that the affirmative team had the best debate, give it up. <laughs> you got a pity clap. It, it's going to be a long hour, guys. <laughs>
If you guys think that the negative team did better, give it up. All right. We have a point for the negative team. Excellent job, guys. Excellent job. Okay. I have to argue for the All right. So, next topic. Continuous deployment is the best model for the security of web applications. This time we have you guys on the negative and you guys on the affirmative. You guys have two minutes. Who's going to start? So continuous deployment gives us the opportunity uh, to, to address web application security early in the software development lifecycle and as quickly and rapidly as possible throughout the stage of, of building our software. So from the, from the day we start the idea to the day we deploy code, we can bake in security and security tests and automation throughout the cycle. The web application space is all about fighting forward. Continuous delivery allows the rapid identification of problems and fighting forward to solve them. Continuous delivery will become a great security model for the future. <laughs> So as, as the uh, resident optimist, uh, the thing that I like about um, the continuous deployment model is that once you start down that path, one of the things you have to fix is your regression and backups are your friend. And the, the faster you can recover from screwing up, the more secure you can be. And so even with a negative spin, I think that's absolutely true that, that moving to that model gives us the tools to recover quickly and uh, push patches quickly, and then when Microsoft sends us crappy patches, we can unwind. When you know Ubuntu or whoever sends us crappy patches, we can unwind. When the kernel plugs, we can unwind it, move forward. We can uh, we can balance security and productivity. You have thirty seconds. What they said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys done? Okay. Go. Cool. All right. Negative. As a former model, I am the best model for the security industry. Yeah. I'm way better than continuous anything. This, wow. All this DevOps nonsense is a fad. <laughs> I think if you guys, you know, if we're, if we're looking back at this in a couple years, I think we're going to see the common criteria for websites make a big resurgence. And I just don't see how you're going to have time to do all that uh, you know, orange book stuff if you're trying all this continuous deployment. It's just not going to work. Yeah, the, the continuous deployment is, is useful. But uh, if it just allows you to continually deliver bad code quickly, I don't see how it solves the problem. You know, I think that one of the main problems that, we're, that we haven't thought about here is that Who's really doing continuous deployment? How many people in here would say they're doing that? Yeah, so this, this is a problem. Web app security doesn't just hit the three unicorns, the 1% the of the 1%. It hits everybody. So my thought is, like, it can't be the solution because no one's using it. Um, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, we're, we're dropping the mic. All right. <laughs> but we're respectful of the microphone, so we're just going to hold it <laughs> safely. Affirmative team, you get one minute for rebuttal. Can we just concede? <laughs> they're, they're waving the white flag right now. Uh, not yet, not yet. You made a good argument. <laughs> I think continuous deployment is going to take off, and, and while James believes that not enough people are using it, I, I truly believe the rugged movement is going to, to capitalize on, on that and, and create you know, buy-in from lots of different companies that, that are not using continuous deployment today. While nobody today is currently using continuous deployment, except the three unicorns in the room, Nobody is really secure either, so I believe James's argument is quite specious. <laughs> and and as, a, as a Gauntlet fan and user, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see that, that those technologies are going to help us with continuous deployment. All right, negative team. One so minute. it is clear, uh, and we can kind of jump off of James' uh, starting point on who's using it. It is clear. PCI is the best 
model for security. <laughs> Thanks for throwing us the no. wind there. No, sir. No, I was not going that, that way. No. There are children watching this. <laughs> Those of you lucky enough to see my talk will uh, fondly remember where I pointed out that Adobe are trying to do secure pipeline CI stuff. Um, we're very aware how secure Adobe are. I think that says it all. <laughs> you want the security practices of Adobe, is what you're saying. <laughs> That's your argument. <laughs> we should do what Adobe do, then we'll be secure. Based on all the proven security wins of Adobe every few months when they release a new update for more O'Day. Thanks. Time. <laughs> How much did Adobe pay for this? Uh, three flat. All right, all right. Okay, so if you thought that the affirmative team won the debate, give it up. <laughs> <laughs> if you thought that the negative team won the debate, <laughs> Who knew negativity was big in the industry? All right. All right. Good job, guys. Good job. Let's keep this moving. Position number three. <laughs> Docker is more secure. This is all based on my slides. You guys have the affirmative on this one. I you just, got two minutes. I just did 45 minutes on this. What are you on about? You're gonna miss my talk. This is this is on you, not me. Docker, Docker, Docker. That was me. Like the slides are up. <laughs> you, All right. Uh, more secure than what? Like if you run shitty code on bare metal versus you run shitty code in a container. Guess what's still shitty? It's your code. Like just because it's run by a Bay Area startup doesn't make your code better. Like. Oh wait. Yeah. So like it's as secure as other shitty things. Uh, it runs on Linux, and Linux is secure. Um, and you can run it with GR security, which is more secure than anything else you're running. So uh, you're going to trust Zen. Mm. Uh, you can trust VMware. Uh, you have more money than security. Um, you're going to trust AWS, which is basically outsourcing your security to some random people in Seattle, uh, which doesn't make you more secure. It just makes it someone's rainy problem. I'll remind you that you are the affirmative on this one. Uh, I, I, I think someone give me a drink. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, drinks. Uh, drinks come in containers, which surprisingly hold things very nicely. <laughs> and they, they keep those things separated from the other things. Now, now, is it you know more secure than like what the questions kind of or the statements kind of ambiguous? But you know, it's like. Um, Whose fault is that? Here? You know, uh, the, the I might have wrote that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was hoping to get, yeah, okay. Uh, but think about this. Docker requires you to take a, a disciplined approach to how you're building uh, your infrastructure. Is that going to be more secure than kind of like slapping stuff on, stuff on a wiki or running some crazy bash scripts and logging into stuff and like, oh yeah, cool thing about Docker is you probably don't have SSH on it. You probably don't have a bunch of other stuff that you have uh, inside your system. All right. Was that like no, okay? Time. Our, that's time. Our official time. Clock. My time sale. I was like, "Whoa! I thought that was a good point." Can I use your laptop for a second as a prop? No. All right. Good. I, I won't damage yeah. it. So, as James said, uh, uh, Docker, you know, things come in containers, you know, like drinks, but oh, containers dude. have no, holes, no, 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 right? No, no, no. And and so, because containers have holes and openings, uh, you know. Th that's a challenge, and that, that's why they're still not more secure. Docker was written by developers for developers. So. <laughs> this is an ad hominem. It must be not. So, I have three words for you Docker run dash dash privileged. <laughs> This, we had this argument with virtualization. We had this argument with cloud. <coughs> we're having it with containerization. Each of these technologies has allowed us to make the same mistakes plus new ones in record time at record scale. <laughs> the 
difference between Docker and not Docker is I can either hand you an atom bomb or I can give it to you in a container. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, please put that in a container. Don't just, don't just give me that. Put it in something. I could wrap it nicely for you. <laughs> Tomcat. <laughs> that that drop the mic. Was that it? You guys are container. Plus, plus what Ben said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, affirmative team. <laughs> okay, so Boyd, please don't do that. Um, let's see, Jack, yes, um, okay. And uh, let's see, yeah, I do want stuff in containers, not atom bombs just sitting out there. So most software is written by developers. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's a drop mic right there. <laughs> no, I got, I got more. So you could run it with minus minus privilege, so don't do that. Like, don't run everything as root. That works on bare metal. Like, don't run stuff badly is your argument of why Docker is not secure. Like, you can give it bad options and it will do bad things. Yeah, same with a hammer. We're done. <laughs> So, so, no, they're, they're, they're negative. It's, it's good. Man, they're desperate. Yeah, they're feeling the pressure. All right. So, I won't go Docker run dash dash privileged. I will instead say Docker run dash dash entry point. So I've just deleted the host root file system. And yes, I can do that. But on Linux, I can secure that. I can give users different privileges. Anybody who runs Docker run can do that. Anybody. You can run a Docker container. You can delete the root file system or any other fun thing you have a good idea. And as far as developers and software, everyone in this room has run into this person. I'm not a developer. I just do web stuff. <laughs> All right, good job, good job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on, what was this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go team us. All right. So before, uh, before we vote um, on who won, everybody take a drink. Yeah. Uh, should we do a chunk? <laughs> I, it wasn't part of the rules, but okay. All right, so audience vote, audience vote. If you guys thought that the affirmative team won the debate, give it up. All right, pretty good, pretty good. If you guys thought the negative team won the debate, give it up. All right, I, I think the affirmative team won that one. We give it to you guys. All right. I think you just saw Dr. Bias there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two to one, two to one. Position number four. Web application firewalls are effective application security tools. We have our affirmative team. Web application firewalls are effective security tools. Who would like to start this one? Chris, you, it seems like you're... Uh, <laughs> it, oh, <I> <laughs> it's... <laughs> Uh, Benedict Manco showed last year that you guys so, can so switch teams. So they are tools, yeah. right? And to, all tools can be used as tools or weapons. Uh, having been in the traditional firewall uh, business uh, not that many years ago, uh, people like to make fun of them. And um, I say, as with traditional firewalls, uh, with web application firewalls, you can make fun of them as soon as you deploy one properly. <laughs> So, so the um, a less flippant answer is that it is a valuable tool used properly. 
If you think throwing a WAF in front of your website makes you safe, it makes you slow and insecure. If you create specific rules for specific problems to buy yourself time, to do what needs to be done, or to mitigate a problem, they work fantastically. Our problem is that's not the way most people use them. They come in some box that also does packet filtering or next-gen firewall, and they click the box, and they say, I'm safe, and so they use it wrong. So if you use them right, people like the intelligent audience we have here understands <laughs> the specific point solutions that WAFs can provide. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that application firewalls, forget about uh, web application firewalls, lost the, um, they lost the, the, the whatever back in the early 90s, right? At Checkpoint beat the hell out of Raptors and all that stuff. However, they're coming back and it's gonna win this time. That's my argument. But just the web. Anything else, Jack? All right. <laughs> Negative team, your rebuttal, please. I think Jack really did most of our work for us. <laughs> he said, all you've got to do is thoughtfully deploy it correctly, configure it right, maintain it. Has it, anybody ever seen one of those? <laughs> Therefore, not effective. <laughs> if you could configure it correctly in the first place, would you need it in the first place? Because you could probably just write a decent web app. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's a, I'm not good enough to web, so can I put this thing in front of my web so it's safer? But then I have to configure it to be good enough at web. Doesn't seem the strongest argument. You have two microphones. How good is your point? You need two microphones. It's it's a two mic drop. Is, is what it is. Yeah, this is a uh, this is pretty pretty simple. It, it uh, as Dan said, the WAF is so difficult to get right. Uh, and it only works against traditional web apps. As we're moving forward and we have more RESTful interfaces, they start to fall apart. They don't deal with JSON. They don't deal with what you're dealing with. So if they can't keep up with the development models, they're ineffective out of the box. All right. I mean, just look, just look where, where did the web app firewalls come from, right? They came from network uh, vendors primarily. You know, and they, they were trying to kind of come in from the wrong angle to solve uh, a problem kind of the wrong way. You know, any vendors who might have a better solution? No. I, I will not promote uh, <laughs> on this because there's still more questions coming. So, all right, affirmative team, your rebel, please. So we know that we're not very good at taking vulnerabilities out of web applications. <clears throat> so at least WAFs will buy us a little bit of time on that side of things. And the only thing I'll say, and that's from the outside in, right? So protecting the applications themselves, but they're also good from the inside out to protect against users. So they have their place. They're not the panacea that everybody, that this question seems to imply they are, but they do have some effectiveness. There's another value to firewalls that we haven't talked about, web app and others, which is that they're a great uh, inspection point for traffic. And since people are going to write crappy code, it lets us know what went wrong because web developers don't log for shit. And so we have to afterthought our detections. To amplify that, Ben said decent web app. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Negative, your rebuttal. Uh, okay, uh, who, who in the audience has a web app firewall deployed right now? Okay, yeah. Do you have a lot of friends in your organization? <laughs> uh, how many of them have like, an actual uh, defensive like blocking type mode? Okay, one, one, two, two, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know how you judge effectiveness, but I have some ideas. Whoever said, yeah, they do buy you some time. I believe that's called latency. Can I 
cut the rebuttal. No, no. no. <laughs> That's All not right. how this game works. So, if, uh, if you thought that the affirmative team won the debate, give it up. That, that sounded like a bit of a pity clap to me. If you thought that the negative team won the debate, give it up. Gallant. All right. Current score, three, one. Number five. I love this one. It's ethically acceptable to accept or transfer the risk of a security breach rather than to secure your code. Congratulations, you guys are the affirmative here. Heck, heck yeah, it is. I mean, okay, maybe not in all instances, but that's not what the question is asking. You know, it is really great. Like, if you're a really small team and you got this really big security problem, but you're really trying to sell the customers, like, you should totally just accept the risk. I think that is, that is correct. And uh, you really want to, like, increase your user base first before fixing the problem. <laughs> is, is blaming Oracle acceptable in this? Can you just, like, can I just say Oracle and be done? <laughs> also, lawyers exist, and uh, they're generally more right than security people. Um, they have more money in jail. <laughs> so, uh, we do this all the time in our daily lives. You have auto insurance, so that if you are a bad driver and you crash into somebody, somebody else will pay the, the hefty bill. We do this in our daily lives everywhere else. It is okay to do it in, in software security. I would argue that it's not just ethically all right, I think it's required <laughs> to transfer or accept risk. No. Because otherwise, can you imagine the impact on short-term revenues? <laughs> That'd be horrible. Looks like they're done. All right. <laughs> they're done. They're done. I, I think they're done. <laughs> so, so fork in them, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Dan brings up a great point about doing this in our daily lives, and, and we actually see this, right? What, what they're arguing is that, you know, for instance, VW, you know, puts out a TDI, and then they should just transfer the risk of that to all their customers or say, screw you, go patch submissions test yourselves. No, we, as a society, we, we have agreed that they're responsible for that defect that they've introduced into their product that they've, they've given to their customers, and they need to take the, the responsibility and accountability to fix that. Just, just like, like software vendors do with their, their breaches and, and their poor code. So let's extend that insurance metaphor for a second. So I can drive like an asshole and never have to pay for anything. So I think it's, uh, that actually, there's a uh, cost to it as well. You're not just transferring risk, you're tra transferring cost. So effectively, uh, arguing the other side is arguing for socialist, socialism. So nice what, well done. So I would just like to quote our morning's keynote speaker, Pete Chesluck, quoting John Vinson saying that, you know, it's really all about giving a shit about your job. <laughs> kind of holistically. So yeah, I'll just get my hippie on and leave it at that. I, I want to point to the, the fact that we're talking about breaches here. Um, we're not talking about uh, accepting vulnerabilities and we're accepting the time to fix a problem. This is, uh, the fan and the feces have met at high speed, and you have to own that. And, you know, a ask T-Mobile uh, about Experian, right? <laughs> do, do they get credit monitoring? Um, you know, how does that work, right? It's, no, um, you can try. It's not going to work. Um, I, I think that, that it's just a, a challenge. Um, you can accept risk, but when it comes down to a breach, you, you own it. And if you try to shirk that um, in a, as a business model, it doesn't work that well. Some people get away with it, some don't. But um, ethically, you own the breach, and the people that own it tend to do the best. All right. Affirmative team. Jack, when it comes to a breach, you don't necessarily own it. The poor chump who's there when the breach happens owns it. <laughs>
Like, I'm not sure if VW were breached. They just kind of like lied to you about emissions. Uh, which is what America is built on. So. <laughs> Your argument is un-American. We're in Texas. Good luck. Says the, uh, the Englishman from San Francisco. You know, we... Uh, we, we, and I think it's a really good point. Like we do value value liberty. I, I think you know. I, I really don't think I don't think we're we're socialist at all over here. I mean, I, I can't believe they're even they're even saying that. Because um, really, we we realize individual responsibility. I, you know, I love signing those eulas, and I'm like reading them all the way down. I'm like, boom! Like I know that I am the one that's ultimately liable for this. So. All right. Negative. Your rebuttal. We don't have to have anything. I think we won anyway. It's, it's over. For, proud to be an American. So when you pass the buck, there's an interest charge. And the more hands that buck passes through, the more the cost is going to rise. So each time you pass that security breach down the line, it got more expensive to fix in that moment, and it got more expensive to fix down the line when you actually have to deal with it. That's still America, baby. And our opposition talks about insurance. The, the part of the insurance is that you pay more when you don't fix it. So that, that's part of the structure. If you're, you're a bad driver, your insurance rates go up because you're, you're accepting that, and that's part of the structure. I, I do want to comment on the opposing team's uh, reference to liberty um, and freedom. They do have the right to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you guys thought that the affirmative team had the best argument, give it up. <laughs> America, red, white, and blue, stars and stripes, no, okay. If you guys thought the negative team had the best argument, give it up. <laughs> Bunch of communists. I, sheesh, all right. The good news is it is now three to two. So, position number six. When forced to choose, stack analysis of code will be more beneficial than dynamic scanning of an application. You guys are on the affirmative. Come on, white noise, really? Who has, who's actually used dynamic scanning and gotten some real benefit out of it? And by the way, I work for a mega vendor who sells a dynamic scanning application. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sort of in the continuous delivery spirit of our competitors over there, I would ask, you know, where do you start? Many of us are just along the journey, so maybe it is we have to lint our code before we can think about anything dynamic. Maybe we just need to make that static scan before we can even begin to consider how to use a dynamic tool, because we must start from somewhere. So if you're not already a unicorn running your dynamic rainbow poops around, maybe static is the place to actually start. <laughs> With the, the key value here is, is the level of visibility. Static analysis is going to provide a level of visibility that the dynamic analyzer does not have into the source code itself. And using static analysis is going to give you that insight that a dynamic analysis tool isn't, isn't capable of providing. So it's going to find things that a dynamic analyzer will not, and it's going to find them and model them in ways that a dynamic analyzer could not ever do. And, and as, as Boyd pointed out, we can find those things earlier in the development lifecycle before we actually deploy the code to make it run. And frankly, uh, static analysis gets you out of the whole DevOps thing. You can control it at the development level, and uh, that's a win. <laughs> and, and it requires talented professionals like this audience to do static analysis. Henry! Yes, 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 yes. All right, negative team, your response, please. Clearly, static analysis is better because it gives you that code level. Wait, we're, we're dynamic analysis? Oh, what you really need is insight. 
into the running system so that you can find real world exploitable vulnerabilities. How can you believe a guy who can switch that fast? <laughs> how, how can you not believe a guy that can switch that fast? <laughs> So, static analysis is uh, useful when you can actually get access to code. Uh, most security professionals that, uh, that are running tests against these applications are running against production, or, um, sadly. And so, there is no ability to get to code. And if you have no ability to get to code, then static is useless. And uh, you only have dynamic as your option. Yeah, okay, uh, who, who in the audience, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna pander to you, I'm just gonna make real life facts available to you. Uh, who, who in the audience uh, uses uh, static code analysis? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, now, when those static analysis tools run, what, what is generated, is it, is it a PDF? How many, how many people would say that usually you get a PDF or some sort of large document out of that static analysis tool? No, no, no takers on that one. Yeah, well, I don't know. There's, there's thread fix to solve that problem. That's right, okay. So I, I think that like what generally comes, what happens in the static analysis world is you run it and then like you know, a couple hours later, days later, you come back and it's like, oh, 400 pages. If you're lucky, PDF, right? And you're like, oh, that's really, that's gonna be great to fix all that and look at it. And then you start going through the results and you're like, how much of this code is actually like in use or like LinkedIn or you know, it's like, oh, this is just some random dependency we wrapped in that's not actually being called anywhere. So, you know, it's really hard to make a, a positive case for static code analysis. This is the boringest vendor pitch I've ever heard. <laughs> I feel like the last time James looked at a stack tool was like 2000. <laughs> all right, you guys good? All right, time. Okay, affirmative team, you got one minute. On the serious side, I've worked for a lot of security vendors, and I would say about 10% of them actually know how to write good code, secure code. So as static analysis, you can actually run it and not get PDFs out of it. You can actually run it when you check code in and get warnings and errors out of it. So you actually train people to write better code with static analysis. Yes. <laughs> My fan. <laughs> Uh, I think, it's, as James said, you, know, you, you get a result back, but there's lots of other tools available, like ThreadFix, that will help you analyze that into the rest of your software development lifecycle and get it to your developers at a time that can fix it. And you know, if, if you're a security person that's only scanning production, uh, you know, probably should look around and look for a new job because you, you know that you have to get earlier in the development lifecycle than that. I'd just like to point out that James did admit that you get a result. The question was more beneficial. Right. Okay, you guys good? Yeah. All right, cool. So dynamic scanners can also pass data through ThreadFix. So ThreadFix does not make a tool better uh, than another tool. It does make it better overall because ThreadFix is awesome, but uh, it is not going to make the security results better. The security results still are lacking with your static analysis tool. You get a lot of nonsense issues reported to you that aren't security issues uh, or that have other compensating controls in other parts of the code that they don't get view into. Uh, you're using static libraries that they don't see and they give you crappy results. Dynamic scanners actually see the running application, can actually uh, interact with it, see what's happening and actually find real vulnerabilities that are exploitable Right out, of, right out of its report that you can actually play with and see right away. And it can also plug into your CI as well. So I think it's just clearly more beneficial. How have you all managed to make security and development sound so boring? <laughs> all right. By the way, the last con 2015 speed debates were sponsored by ThreadFix. <laughs> wow. All right. If you guys thought that the affirmative team won the debate, give it up. If you guys thought that the negative team won the debate, give it up. All right, we have a point for the affirmative. The score is now three to three. They came back. And you all should have won, so yeah. Hey, can I ask a question? Because I, I don't live in the application security world. How many people have heard of Swamp, the software assurance marketplace? 
And who has opinions about it? We should chat later. So I, I, I can tell you that OWASP is actively working with uh, Swamp in open sourcing the whole platform. Yeah. Cool. Thank, thanks. Cool. Yeah. All right. Position number seven. Open source applications are inherently more secure than closed source applications. <laughs> you guys are the affirmative. Can, we, can you just bring the bottles of Jack Daniels up and put them across the front here? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Oracle database is closed source. Bam. Postgres, Postgres is not. <laughs> IE closed source. Chrome is not. Chromium, whatever. <laughs> that was close. Um, Flash is closed source. You see where this is going? Hmm. Like, sure. Um, there have been some examples where things haven't been great, but the closest ones are generally far, far more awful. Like, is DB2 good? No. Uh, just, just Postgres is the only database that isn't like riddled with ODA. Um, cool, come at me. I mean, open source applications are clearly <coughs> more secure than others because the source is available for inspection and for testing. That's a, and that's a dynamic and static, and that's a real high priority of everyone who's not bad guys. <laughs> and it's a real high priority for people before anything is, uh, is, is found to be breached. So clearly, clearly open source applications have the heavy band. Yeah, I got enough. <laughs> IE is a closed source, uh, Firefox not. Um, uh, let's see, what else you say, Adobe? Let's just go back to that argument. I think that's a really strong one. So I just want to repeat the whole thing. You want to just say it again? We've got a better accent. Java, is Java? Java, Java counts, right? Like, uh, Windows, unless you pay a lot of money, is closed source. Linux, which is free of security problems, is, is open source. I'm biting the inside of my mouth. Um, this is not the best position to argue. <laughs> Git, Git is open source perforce. I'm, I'm running. Docker. Docker is open source. Hyper-V is an uh, AXW pars on. Oh, God. It was nice winning while we could. All right. Negative team. Heartbleed. <laughs> Shell shock. Venom. Let's talk about KVM, the most popular hypervisor in the world. Currently, KVM is at 13,500,000 lines of code. That's a lot of code. If you look at the growth pattern of KVM over the last 15 years, it is linear. They throw nothing out. How much cruft is that? Oh, it's open source, by the way, because there are approximately, in the last year, 4,000 contributors. Hmm, this is good. Yeah, I, I, I feel secure. How about you? Oh, Venom? Yeah. And by the way, there are roughly 6,000 commits per month on KVM. That's an awful lot of change, and I don't know about you, but I'd love to see the processes that make that go and keep it secure. Yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> don't worry, it's secure cruft. <laughs> How many people have used an open source library in, in, in their career? Well, probably almost everyone. How many have used one, a library where it stopped being maintained because no one was updating it or, or main, doing anything with it, right? With, it, with closed source, you have a vendor, you've got someone who's incentivized to help maintain it. All I can say is I've looked at every single line of source code in every open source package that I've ever used, period. Hey man, Oracle 9i is unbreakable. <laughs> Don't forget it. Jesus. This is not for the Jimby, this is just for you to chew on in case you're stressed. They end up Jack Daniels? No. Okay. We've made our case. All right. Permanent team. How many people have used software by a company that's gone out of business? Oh, you're fucked. How many people, of those thousands of commits to KVM, 
How many can you look at? Oh, all of them. How many commits to VMware can you look at? Oh, fuck all again. How many, how many commits to Hyper-V can you go and look at? Oh, the same zero again. So you can actually go and look at these. I'm not saying people do, but you have the fucking option. Whereas with closed source, you don't. And when that company goes out of business, you are so screwed. Whereas if an open source thing is not maintained, you can maintain it, or you can pay someone else to maintain it. That is why open source is more secure, because it gives you the power to do these. People may not be doing them, but you have that option. With closed source, you do not. All right, negative team. Ida Pro. True Crypt. Would you guys raise your hand again if you were using one of those uh, dead open source projects? Yeah, okay, now keep your hands up if you're maintaining them yourself or paying someone to do so. Yeah, reality check. Oh, it sucks to be you, doesn't it? <laughs> right on, okay, so thanks for making our point for us there. OpenSSL was one of the most commonly used frameworks and after Heartbleed, a lot of companies stepped up to maintain it. And, and, and the code is still shit. <laughs> All right. So if you thought that the affirmative team had the better argument, give it up. If you thought that the negative team had the better argument, give it up. All right. Point for the affirmative team. <laughs> We have a score of four to three with one question left. One question left. <laughs> Position number eight. Critical vulnerabilities should always be disclosed responsibly. You guys have the affirmative. Use of the word responsible and the term disclosure is irresponsible. <laughs> I just, I, I'm sorry, I have to say it. Um, as we internet enable and computerize more and more things with more and more common code, when you figure out a vulnerability in a toaster, that doesn't mean that vulnerability is not an, a pacemaker. We have a responsibility, we talked about ethics before, we have a responsibility to disclose in a coordinated manner, I'm allergic to that word even though I'm on that side, to make sure that vendors have an opportunity to solve problems, that the end user has an opportunity to mitigate problems. We need to act like adults. Part of the reason that most of us don't get invited to Capitol Hill, besides our files, um, is that, um, <laughs> You know, we, we as a community aren't always responsible, and uh, we, need to, we need to be responsible. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a loaded question because the word responsible is uh, not exactly well defined here. So it really depends upon what we mean by that. But I gave you a loaded question? You really? did give us a loaded question. It's wow. amazing, isn't it? Hey, no, it's not fair. <laughs> so, but it, Here's the thing, though, is that, it, particularly what you said, Jack, is that uh, there, with the IoT, connected cars, pacemakers, insulin pumps, nets, whatever, that, whatever it is, it can have a material effect on our physical safety, so we do have to give the vendors some opportunity and the users some opportunity to solve the problems before we actually release them to the general community. So, but I will say this, that responsible can also mean limited disclosure within the community, depending on who you, who you disclose it to. So, again, to the, to the point of definition. All right, negative team. How many people were on the internet in the early 2000s? Yeah, a bunch of you. How many people remember gobbles? Exactly, that's why you don't want responsible disclosure because that period was awesome. <laughs> dropping Ode on people, dropping spools, that was the best time on the internet and we want that back. That's why responsible disclosure is bullshit. Ode every day. If I find an O-Day, the only responsibility I have is to my pocketbook <laughs> to find the best O-Day uh, broker to sell it off to. America. It's opportunity and liberty. Freedom, Freedom also. This didn't work for us last time. I'm not sure we want to play. Let's just go with the team goggles. 
Yeah, the, you know, this whole responsibly thing just sounds like a way for people to uh, delay disclosure until it doesn't matter anymore. And so uh, I think we need to disclose quickly, not responsibly. We've got to get things out there quickly so people can start dealing with it. Not this responsibly, that's legalese, that's, that's Capitol Hill talk for let's hide it for 10 years. <laughs> Like, I mean, we're, you're, by, by doing this, you're basically invoking more lawyers into your, into your life. Like, who wants that? Right? No, no way. All right. As a non-security guy, I sort of see the word responsibly as immediately. If I have one of those pacemakers, the first thing I want to do is run away from my Wi-Fi. You know, I don't want to count on the fact that somebody might not know about it, because the fact of the matter, or maybe I should walk, yeah. <laughs> wow, I cracked me up. All right, so, um, so I want to know, because you know what? If that vulnerability is already known, I'm already at risk. I want to be able to manage my own risk, and I want to be able to do that at the right time. So maybe responsibility is immediately with, with the great power to find vulnerabilities we have the responsibility to manage them responsibly and all i want to i just want to point out that the other team now on top of being socialists in texas are now anarchists as well look at my hat and, and bank of is apparently using the force right okay all right negative team it's interesting that you say uh, immediately and uh, you want to know because when you tell a vendor they sit in it for six months and you don't know, when you drop Ode, other than lols, everyone finds out about it and everyone is in their best position to work out how to defend it rather than some black hats who will leak it and a vendor having it. Everyone has it and then you are in a stronger position. So we just won that one because, yeah. But we didn't, so we're good. You guys good? Drop OD. All right. Dropping the OD. All right. So if you thought that the affirmative team won the debate, give it up. Team Gobble. If you thought that the negative team won the debate, give it up. Gobbles. One more time. Affirmative. Negative. I, I think that goes to the affirmative team. Wow. Sorry. We got a superhero right there. <laughs> what that means is that the speed debate's in its high. Oh. So congratulations, guys. Thank you all for attending the speed debates. Go ride the bull, get some food. Thank you, guys.